So Grant is a producer at Private Division where he supports the development teams for both Kerbal Space Program and Kerbal Space Program 2, which um, from what I understand is a game, which I have not, I'm a gamer too, uh, and I have not played it yet, so now I have to uh, investigate this. Um, and Grant urged a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Purdue University. He hopes through Kerbal Space Program to inspire the next generation of aerospace engineers. Awesome. Well, this is certainly the place to inspire. Please welcome Grant to the stage. Come on down. Thank you. <clears throat> so, once again, thank you, Cass. Um, my name is Grant Gertz, as you mentioned. I'm a producer at Private Division, and I support the Kerbal Space Program franchise. So, quick show of hands, how many folks have played Kerbal before? Okay. Uh, I think it's a little early in Kerbal's life cycle, but I'm curious. Has anybody here already been inspired by Kerbal to want to pursue aerospace in any way? Okay, I, that's even more than I honestly expected at this point, so that's, that's fantastic. <clears throat> so, this is the first time that I've spoken in front of a group since I did communications over a decade ago in college, so I feel a little like a Kerbal friend here on the left, um, and so I figured I'd make this a little easier on myself and tell a story and answer a question I get all the time, which is, how do you go from being an aerospace engineer to working on games and then eventually finding your way to an aerospace game? <clears throat> So I always knew that I was going to pursue a degree in aerospace engineering. I was strong in math and physics in high school. I spent my summers building and launching model rockets with my grandfather. And so when I'm trying to figure out what do I want to do after high school, aerospace made sense to me and seemed like a great choice. So I enrolled at Purdue in 2006, survived my first year engineering courses, and managed to land a great internship with the Propulsion Technology Group down in Redstone Arsenal. Uh, and that really kind of helped me figure out where I wanted to go inside of aerospace. But I'd say about two to three years into my time at Purdue, I started to get this voice in the back of my head of, this doesn't really seem like it's what you wanted. You're not quite enjoying this, and you're not sure if this is going to be a great fit. But I had gotten into my first choice, I had landed the internship, and I'm progressing through all my coursework. So I just kind of brushed it off as cold feet. I'm making decisions that are affecting the rest of my life. I'll just push that to the side and, and continue on and, and, and push, through, push through with my degree. <clears throat> so graduation rolls around. I get a job with Aerojet Rocketdyne as an energetics manufacturing engineer. And at this point, I'm thrilled to be working in the industry. I've spent all this time going through and getting my degree, and I'm happy to be hands-on with rockets on a daily basis. But a year or two rolls by, and, and that voice pops back up in my head. You know, are you really happy here? Is this really something you want to spend the next 30 to 40 years of your life doing? And once again, I've spent my entire life getting to this point. It's all I've ever thought about doing. How would I even take an aerospace degree and do something else with it? So I kind of push it back to the side again, thinking I'll find my niche and keep moving forward. I'm still early in my career. There's time to figure out what's right for me. So about three years after joining Aerojet, I move up to Seattle, I trade, use, trade solid propulsion for monopropellant thrusters, I start doing some process engineering, statistical process control, find a few projects inside the company thinking maybe if I get more involved, I'll feel better about what I'm doing. But as the months roll by, the voice pops back in my head once again, and I realize I need to start paying attention to this and answer the question of what am I really going to want to do for the rest of my life. <clears throat> so. August of 2014, uh, the Penny Arcade Expo rolls into Seattle. For those that aren't aware, the Penny Arcade Expo, or PAX, is a consumer-focused gaming convention. Uh, you get to meet game developers, you get hands-on with the best upcoming games, um, and you can attend a bunch of different panels. And as a gamer, long-time gamer, it's how I spend my free time, it's how I stay connected with my friends across the country. It's something that I always wanted to go to, and I finally got the opportunity. So one of the panels there was titled how to, how to Get Into Games from Outside the Game Industry. And at this point, I'm not really considering games as a reasonable transition for my career, but I am curious about how folks have transitioned from one career to another. So I sit in on this panel, and there's a woman there from Ball Aerospace, uh, and she talks about how she went and spent her spare time building games outside of her aerospace career and eventually transitioned that into something full-time. And while this is fascinating to me, I don't spend my spare time building games at this point. I'm not a designer or a programmer, and I'm definitely not an artist. Um, 
So I, I, I think it's interesting, and I take some inspiration and decide I'll, I'll at least go look around at various websites and other studios to see what kind of jobs there might be in the, uh, in the game field that maybe I wasn't aware of. <clears throat> and that's when I come across the role of a producer. And I start to notice that a producer means a lot of different things depending on the studio, but the roles that I was looking at, there was a lot of crossover between my day-to-day -day as a manufacturing engineer and the day-to-day -day of a producer. <clears throat> Both of them are owning a particular process or pipeline that contributes to a larger product. Neither of them technically work directly hands-on with the product. Uh, manufacturing engineers tend to work through assembly technicians. Producers work through game developers, i.e. those designers, programmers, and artists I mentioned before. And uh, you also have to facilitate communication between a wide variety of roles, um, both on the manufacturing side and, again, in production. And finally, both roles have to strike a balance between the needs of the product, the needs of the team, and the needs of the schedule. So I see all these things, and I, I tell myself, I can, I can actually do this. I think there's a realistic way that I can take my experience that I've gotten through my education and my time manufacturing to actually be a successful producer in the game industry. So I work with a career coach, rebrand myself a little bit, make sure that my experience speaks to what they're asking for in these different job descriptions, and I start throwing out a bunch of resumes and applications, breaking all of the rules that they told me in all of those panels, which is I don't know a single soul in the industry, I'm applying online without any recommendations, and I have no relevant game experience. So I'm a standout candidate. Um, but as the months go by and countless rejection later, I end up getting the opportunity with a studio called ArenaNet. Now, ArenaNet makes what's known as a massively multiplayer online role-playing game um, called Guild Wars 2. Very similar to World of Warcraft, which is something you will probably be a little more familiar with if you're not big into games. And so I take the opportunity to dive in and learn everything I can about game production. Um, what's it like working with game teams? What are the tools they use? What are the processes they work with? And obviously transitioning to a pretty vastly different career and work environment. And uh, I notice as the months go by that that voice hasn't popped back up into my head. And for the first time, I realize this is where I can be happy for the rest of my career and something that I hope to do for as long as the industry is going to have me. Now, one of the downsides about games is that they suffer layoffs, I would say, more often than other industries. And in uh, February of 2019, ArenaNet had some pretty sizable layoffs even outside of the game industry. And uh, I found myself looking for my new opportunity. And that's when I stumbled across the role of a producer at Kerbal. Um, and so <clears throat> at this time, I, I put in my applications, this time with actual experience and some recommendations and some references. And I end up landing the job in April of 2019. And so I figured I'd spend the last few minutes, now that we're kind of up to current day, talking about what Kerbal is for those that aren't aware, uh, and some of my big takeaways that have come over the last year of working there. So, Kerbal is an engineering and simulation game where you're asked to build planes, rockets, rovers, satellites, probes, basically anything you would need to explore the homeworld of Kerbin, as well as the planets, moons, and asteroids that inhabit the Kerbolar system that make up the rest of the game. <clears throat> and we ask you to interact with this in the same way that we interact with our, with space in our world, which is you need to know the difference between all the different engine types, propellant types, what is thrust-to-weight ratio, how do you stage a rocket, why would you want to stage a rocket. You have to know how to reach an orbit, how to stabilize your orbit. What's the difference between an apoapsis and a periapsis? How do you transfer to orbits to reach your destination? What is delta-v and how do I use it and use it efficiently? And none of these are trivial concepts, especially if you don't have an aerospace engineering background. <clears throat> and what our players have shown time and time again is that this makes for engaging gameplay. And the folks that take those foundations and build upon them are able to land on new planets, deploy those rovers on moons, and build orbital research stations, <clears throat> and can honestly have an impact on some of the lives of our players. We keep a file on hand of all the messages that we receive from players throughout the years, talking about how Kerbal's made them want to be better at math and science, target an engineering degree or maybe a job at NASA one day. We get messages from JPL and Goddard talking about how much Kerbal's meant to their teams and photos of the different signs and game memorabilia that, that, that they have hanging around. And for us on the Kerbal team, these are the real successes. A lot of them don't have the opportunity to work in the aerospace industry or never have, 
but they're big fans. We follow all the launches, we track all the latest news, um, and seeing this kind of stuff and seeing how Kerbal can impact the world outside of games uh, means everything to us and the team. So I can't stand up here and necessarily give you advice on how to be successful in your aerospace career, or maybe talk about our next upcoming revolutionary technology. But what I can say is we're knee-deep in production on our sequel, Kerbal Space Program 2. We're humbled to be a part of things like this and get invited to other space industry events. And we're really hoping to continue to build these re relationships as we move forward. forward. And uh, hopefully next time I ask the question, has Kerbal made an influence on an aerospace life, we'll get even more hands than we saw this time. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your uh, Satellite 2020. <clears throat>